Hi there. Right, sorry about that. We really are ready to go now. So having got you all excited with sandwiches and teams, we're actually going to try and get your attention again. Um, is, is everybody in a team? But they're too excited about getting the team names now. <laughs> is, is everyone in a team? You all know who your teams are? Okay, fine. Um, Holly, do we know how many teams we've got? You can count up for me. Right, brilliant. Um, sorry, it's been a bit more lunching than learning so far, but we've got um, till about two o'clock, so we should have to find time to cover everything we want to cover. Um, thank you for coming along. Some quick introductions. Um, my, my name's Heather Andrew. I'm the CEO of NeuroInsight in the UK. In case you're wondering, if you're ever on a bike and you see a fox and you're heading towards a bollard, don't turn around and look at the fox. It's a really bad move. Um, my other colleagues who are around, you've got Alish, come and show your faces. Um, Alish and Holly, who will be helping run today as well. Um, and as I said, we, we, we work, all work for NeuroInsight. We're a consumer neuroscience company. We measure brain response to communications. Um, we're one of the world leaders in this, if it doesn't sound too boastful. Um, everything we do has been validated in the real world. We've won lots of awards for effectiveness. And what we want to do today is share with you some of the things we've learned through the projects we've done to do with how the brain responds to different sorts of communication. Um, we're going to be talking about all sorts of communications. Lots of the examples we show you will actually be from TV, but what I'm talking about specifically are things that transcend media boundaries and are, are learnings which apply all across the whole new raft of media that we're interested in. So, um, neuroscience. It, it's some th we get, today, you're going to get a bit of theory. You're going to get a bit of practice, and that's why you're in teams. We're going to try and make this quite fun. Um, hopefully, the time will go very fast. And you get some lunch as well, provided you all, all manage that. So, and I think there are even some sweets coming around. So, so there you go. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit about brains. Um, not, not a load of theory, but a few of the sort of backgrounds to why we measure what we measure. Um, I think in the world we're in today, and particularly in an event like that, we see all these amazing new innovations, all these startups, all the new technologies. And it, the, the tendency for all of us, and certainly for me, is to focus on complexity and change. You know, the world is more complex than ever before. Everything's changed faster than ever before. And we hear those things all the time. But actually, the truth is, from our brain's point of view, it's not quite such a problem. Our brains are actually very flexible. Our brains can cope with change very well. That's how they've evolved over millennia to cope with change in the world. And from our brain's point of view, all this new media stuff isn't that complicated. There are lots of things that the brain still does in the same way. The challenge is about measurement. The conventional ways of measuring the way that people respond to communication can't be, communi can't be ch sort of carried over and applied so easily to the new world. Um, and that's where we see, see neuroscience fitting in. So one of the fundamental dif difficulties with conventional research is we don't always say what we think as human beings. It's very difficult for us to express what we're really thinking. Sometimes we don't want to, and often we don't actually know really what's driving our decisions. Um, and there's particularly uh, some factors driven by the divide between our left and right brains. Now, I'm sure you've all heard about left brain and right brain. The sort of simple way of looking at it is that left brain is rational, right brain's emotional. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. But what is true is that a lot of our decision making happens in the right brain, which is responsible for big picture, the overall feel of something, our global view of the world. We need that global view to make decisions. And yet, nearly all our speech capability is in the left hemisphere of the brain. Um, left hemisphere is much more detailed, much more rational, much more focused on the little picture rather than the big picture. So what tends to happen with words-based research is you ask people a verbal question and this about how they make a decision. And what's happening in their right brain, big picture stuff, has to be translated through the left brain in order to be expressed. And the left brain puts a more rational spin on it without you know, any ill intent at all. That's just how the left brain works. The left brain's in charge of talking, so it gets its way. Um, there's a very graphic sort of example of that. Years ago, um, the neuroscientists, uh, they used to treat epilepsy by severing the two hemispheres of the brain. So people who've had this done didn't actually know, one part of the brain didn't know what the other part was doing. Um, they could function pretty well in the everyday world, but there was no communication between the hemispheres at all. Um, and there was one boy that had, had this done, and they asked him verbally, so left brain responded, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be an accountant. I like, you know, like pie charts and numbers and you know, I want to be an accountant when I grow up. They then um, covered his uh, left eye, which communicates with, sorry, his right eye, which communicates with the left brain. So only his left eye and right brain could see. Um, so his right brain could see pictures. And they gave him a whole load of pictures and said, point to the one you want to be when you grow up. And he didn't point to the accountant. He pointed to a racing driver. And both those answers were true. You know, part of his personality wanted to be a racing driver. Part of it wanted to be an accountant. 
Um, the problem with a lot of words-based stuff is you only ever see the accountant and you don't get the view of the racing driver. And both of those are really important when we look at how people respond to communication and how our brains work in you know, th the world we live in today. So that's really where neuroscience fits in, and it provides metrics that can help. So what we do is we fit headsets to people. You'll be seeing some of these later on, just a little spoiler there. And we measure brain response in different areas of the brain to communication. Because the brain's very specialized, different parts of the brain do different things. If we can identify what part of the brain's active at a given point in time, we can say what sort of cognitive process is going on. We can't read minds, but we can identify some sort of brain process. And so the things that we report on are things that are important and useful for marketers and insight people and media people. The key thing, the most important thing we look at is what we call long-term memory encoding. A um, bit of a mouthful. By, by long-term, we mean anything more than a few minutes. We're interested in what's being stored away into memory. So it's not what's already in memory. We're interested in what the brain is storing or sending down into memory as it's exposed to a piece of communication or it engages with a platform. So we're looking at what the brain's choosing to st store away into memory. Th that's really, really important because... If something doesn't get into memory, however strong our emotional response to it, however much we like something, if it doesn't get into memory, and specific of the brand or product or key message doesn't get into memory, it can't possibly affect our future actions. because It's just not there in our heads. It sounds really obvious when I say it, but it's absolutely essential. So for, if, if stuff doesn't get into memory, it can't affect our future actions. But it goes further than that because our brains are really selective. We only, we only put into memory a tiny proportion of what we're exposed to. And so the brain's constantly making subconscious decisions about what information to store away. And what it stores away is stuff that the brain says subconsciously, that's interesting, that's useful, I might want to act on that one day. So if we can identify, as we can through measuring brain response, when the brain is active and therefore what's being sent down into memory, it's not just an indicator that the brain can act on that information, it's an indicator it's likely to act on that information. So memory encoding actually correlates pretty well with decision-making and, um, and, and future behavior. Um, there's lots of papers to prove that. I'm not going to go into that today, but we always make those things available. It has a very strong link between memory and, and behavior. And for that, that's the reason it's our most important measure. If you see strong long-term memory encoding at the point that a key message is being delivered, there's a good indication that message is likely to be acted on. Does that make sense to everyone? So, key measure, memory encoding. We also look at attention. We look at visual attention. It's sort of pretty much how it sounds. Um, if you're doing something like playing a computer game, you'll have very high visual attention. You won't necessarily high have, have high memory encoding. So it's useful to get people's attention, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to act on anything afterwards. So it's a bit of a gross negative check for us. Um, we report on a measure we call engagement. It better described a sense of personal relevance. If we're watching something that's personally relevant to us, a member of our family, favorite football team, this part of our brain will be active. It's really important because if the, this part of our brain's active, it tells the brain, this is part of my world, might be important, it's more likely to get into memory. So, so we measure that um, engagement or personal relevance. And then we have two measures of emotional response. And emotion is really important as well. We, we look at the strength of emotional response, emotional intensity, and we look at the direction of emotional response, which we call approach withdrawal. It's almost literally that. It's, do I want to move towards something, usually because I like it, I want to engage with it? Do I want to move away from it, withdraw from it? So we can give people strength and direction of emotional response. And it's the combination of emotion and memory that's really, really important. Um, as a brand or as a product or as a platform, what we generally want to do is to create a positive emotional experience that people will remember and link to our brand so they can find it afterwards. So those are the two key things we're most interested in looking at. And we do it by measuring brain response second by second as people wear these headsets and um, engage with a bit of communication. So no conscious response is required. We're not, when people are wearing the headsets and we're measuring brain response, they're not doing anything else. They're not answering questions. They're not moving a mouse. They're not moving a dial. So it's a very, very non-intrusive way of measuring response. Um, we've worked across lots of platforms. Um, you're going to see a lot of TV today. We don't, by no means work just for television. We do loads of work in social media, online, um, outdoor, radio, press, um, brand proposition work. So uh, we're using TV, for example, but we work across lots of platforms. We understand the unique qualities of each of those. But what I'm more interested in today is looking at some constants. Because we all will be working in different worlds on different platforms. And so I, I figured what's most interesting to this sort of audience is not talking just about the things that are specific to one platform, but the constants in terms of brain response that we can rely on regardless of the platform. Because they've got an evolutionary basis. There's, our brains have a vested interest in working that way. Sorry, I'm standing right in your way here. Can you see? Okay. Um, 
so how this is going to work, um, we're going to do, we're going to have a quiz for you. And we're going, what we're going to do is there's going to be nine rounds of the quiz. Each bit of the quiz is going to be introduced with a bit of theory. We're not just here to work you hard. We're going to tell you something about the brain, something about why it works, how it works. And that's, that's your learn bit. Um, beyond that, we're going to, um, we're then going to give you some examples um, and we're going to ask you to make some decisions and choices about those things. And there are a couple of bonus rounds as well, which might include a bit of interaction, so you might enjoy that. Um, normal answers, if you get, get a right answer, you get a point. Bonus rounds, you can get a few more points. Um, there is a prize at the end. Um, it is a real prize. We run um, syndicated omnibus type studies of every month or so. We love to get new clients in, so it's in our interest to get you guys to try this thing out. So the winning team, however many of you are in there, we're happy to give you a free slot in a study. Now, a client would pay £16,000 for that, so it's a genuine offer. Um, it, you'd have to fit in one of our pre-existing studies, but they run every month or so. It could be for um, a bit of video, either TV ad or a bit of VOD. It could be for looking at something like a website. We're happy with that. It's a genuine offer. In our it's good for us because you get to try out what we do. Um, hopefully, it's, it's good for you because we've got a prize if you've got five people in your team worth um, £80,000. I mean, genuinely, that's what clients would pay. So it's, it's a real offer. Um, we're also, because we want to generate trial, and I'll remind you at the end, if there's anyone here who at the end of this feels they'd like to try out the methodology and you're not on the winning team, we're happy to offer 50% 50, 50 discount on, on that. So, so everyone's a winner. So, th so there are real prizes for stake. So I hope you've chosen your team members wisely. Um, so we said teams of three or four. Your audience is slightly bigger because we've got a lot of people. So we're going to kick off. Is everyone ready? Um, is there anyone who came in late and who isn't in a team? Everyone knows which team they're in? Yeah? Okay, fine. Have we got a team of only three or four people? Three? Right. Would you like to join these ladies in front or, or behind or in deep? Right. So everyone knows what team they're in. Excellent. So round one. Are you ready? We're going to work you hard now. You've had enough listening to me. Um, but the first sort of principle that, what, regardless of platform, regardless of media, that, that is true about how the brains work is that shouty types of advertising, shouty sorts of communication tends not to work. And the reason for that is, that, and by, by shouty, I mean stuff that's telling you very overtly to buy something or focusing uniquely on price. Now, that's not to say there's not a role for that sort of advertising because there, there often is. But it's not, but, but it, in, the, in general, our brains don't like to be told what to do. There's part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex that acts a bit like a barrier. If we, it, it's there to stop us being endless, endlessly cred, credulous. If somebody tries very hard to back us into a corner, to sell us something we don't want, to make us do something we don't want to do, that bit of the brain comes up and it basically, or comes down, if you like, a barrier, basically stops, it, it makes us say, no, I know what you're doing, I'm not interested. It's why even under hypnosis, you can't get people to do things that they really wouldn't do. We've got this inhibition me mechanism there. Um, and so what tends to happen is very in-your-face sort of advertising, unless people are really in the market and really want to just know price and nothing else, tends not to be as effective as advertising where the benefits of the product are integral to telling a story. The, the product is interwoven into the message. Um, its benefits are showcased rather than sold. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I'm going to show you uh, some examples from television, or at least Alice is in a second. But uh, and this principle applies to every medium. Um, in some cases, when you are you know, online, you have the very last sort of thing in the chain. Yes, of course, at that stage, you need to give information like price and product. But you know, particularly in anything where you're trying to build people's perception of the brand, generally, softly, softly is more effective than, um, than hard sell. And by more effective, we've actually, um, this is all based on stuff that we've done where we've benchmarked things and done statistical correlations based on the strength of um, branding impact of individual ads. So what we're going to do in a minute is to show you some examples. And we're going to do this for each of the rounds. You're going to see three examples. And we're going to ask you to decide on the basis of the criteria, in this case, how shouty they are, how hard they're shouting, which ad is likely to elicit the best and worst brain response. So it's simply in this criteria, is it a shouty ad? If you think it's very shouty, it's likely to be less effective. And by best and worst brain response, what we're actually talking about is real metrics and it's memory encoding at branding. I'll come to you in one second. Um, so, so, we've, you know, what, so what we're, and we know the answer. It's based on objective measure. Sorry, yes. Um, if, yes, you are. I mean, we're going to move through the rounds fairly quickly, but put your hand up if you've got a particular question and one of us will come and ask it. Yeah. 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 
it's not absolutely the same. The, the, the tolerance levels will vary by culture. You're absolutely right, because some cultures are more in your face than others. Um, but the basic principle of the brain doesn't like to be told what to do is an evolutionary one, and it's a very important one. The point is, that in some cultures, the brain's more used to being told what to do, so the, the, the tolerance is higher. But the, the principle absolutely holds the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, find, I don't. So shout is maybe a bad word in terms of. I don't mean the volume at which people talk. I mean the intention of what you're doing, the the desire to overtly sell as opposed to showcase a benefit. Yeah. Okay, Alish. Alish is going to take you through these in each each case because he knows them much better than I do. So. Hello, I think I'm the game's host, and I'm here to make sure that all the rounds run on time. So uh, on to the first round. Without ado. Um, at number one, DJ. At Bastor, every bath we design, every tap we create, every basin and WC we make looks amazing. And what's more, many of our bathrooms now carry an impressive designer label. The Bastor sale is on, but only for a limited period. So pick up the chic Manhattan suite, all inclusive, for just £899 while you can. Bath store. Now everyone can have a beautiful bathroom. Okay, so number one is bath store, in case you guys didn't see. Uh, number two. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. Bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens. Brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Green-coloured ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with the moon on their wings. These are a few of my favourite things. Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver-white winters that melt into springs. These are a few of my favourite things. When the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad, I simply remember my favourite things, and then I don't feel so bad. Wow, so that's number two. Uh, and here is number three. So number three, dairy milk, and here they are once again. Now you have one minute, I'm gonna start the timer in a second, to decide which one was the best and which one was the worst. Um, time starts now. If you have um, a decision, just please put your um, notepad in the air and we'll come and collect that from you. Okay, time is up. Please put your um, team name on the bit of paper and then which ad you thought was the worst and which ad you thought was the best and then put the piece of paper in the air and we'll come and collect it from you. I think that's everyone. All right, so hopefully uh, that's a bit clearer now. So as we watch the ads, try and think of which is the best and which is the worst based on the explanation that we gave you beforehand. All right. Um, and these are the winners and the losers. So <laughs> uh, a few sighs there, a few. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to show you what you mean just on this one occasion. We're not going to show you the brain trace for every single one because we're here till about midnight. Um, but what, when we're talking about best and worst, what we're interested in is we're, we actually track a load of metrics, but a key one is strength of memory response at final branding. So what you're going to see is how memory response goes up and down as we watch the Cabra's Gorilla ad. Um, you've got time along the bottom, but the horizontal axis. We've got the 30-second ad in this case. Up the vertical axis is strength of memory response. The higher it is, the stronger it is. There's a very interesting thing about memory. Um, our brains don't work like video cameras. They work like still cameras. So as we're putting something into memory, we actually put in snapshots. Um, we use those snapshots to recreate the piece of communication afterwards. So what we're really interested in when we're analyzing things is saying, does the brain have enough snapshots to take in the story of the ad? And do the snapshots include the branding? If they don't include the branding, you get that thing where you can remember an ad really well. You've got no idea what it was for. In the case of this ad, the brain doesn't have to work very hard in memory to actually um, understand what's going on because it's a very simple narrative. You're only going to see three peaks of memory response, but they happen at key moments. Um, you can see two li the dotted lines are norms. We're interested in what happens above that top dotted line. There'll be two lines coming out. It's left and right brain, red and blue. Look at the red line. That's th what's following the detail of the narrative. So if you could play that now, Helena, please. And so you get the first peak of response when you get the first bit of information for the brain. It's the gorilla, and the brain puts that in as a snapshot. Now it knows it's a gorilla, so the brain doesn't work hard again until you get a new bit of information, which is the drum kit. So that goes into memory as well. So the brain says it's a gorilla playing the drums. What's all this about then? Don't really know. Don't really understand what's going on. Ah, it's an ad for Cadbury's chocolate and the branding goes in really strongly. This was researched amongst an audience in Australia who'd never seen the ad before, so it's first viewing of the ad. So we look, look at lots of other things. We'll be looking at what's happening emotionally during the ad and what's happening in terms of personal relevance and so on. But just from the point of view of memory, that's a really effective ad. It's creating an intrigue for the brain. The brain's saying, what's going on here? When the brand comes on, it's a resolution to the intrigue. It gets a really high, high peak of response. The only reason Skoda isn't higher is that you see Skoda several times during it. You don't get that big reveal at the end. So for those of you who put Skoda, it was actually a great ad. It just didn't quite get so high right at the very end. Um, so second point um, is that regardless of the medium, regardless of the platform, our brains love storytelling and narrative. It's how we make sense of the world, and particularly in terms of memory, our key metric. What goes into memory is bits of information that the brain needs to make sense of a story. Um, so you saw it with Cadbury's Gorilla. You get one bit of information, the gorilla, next bit the drums, next bit the brand. That tells a story. If you've got a more complex narrative, you get lots more peaks of response. Um, so what it means is that um, stories, puzzles, and narratives are very effective at getting the information into memory. And if you can make your branding intrinsic to the narrative in some way, it's actually a really, really effective way of delivering branding because our brains are following the story and the branding gets enormous by default. Um, so again, Alish is going to come on in it, with his bossy way. <laughs> He's going to tell you, give you, show you three more ads, and we want you to think about in terms of you know how strong the narrative is, how 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 well do you think they'll do in terms of um, branding response? Thank you. So hopefully now everyone knows the drill. Uh, this is a timer, by the way. I'm not on my phone as I'm talking to you. Um, so number one. Number one. Whatever deals I've got, I love it. You know that Boots do quite a lot of extras as part of this standard price. I love a bargain, and Boots have all the deals. I like points. going in there for the vantage points. There are additional features being added in that other opticians might charge for, so yes, that's definitely attractive. I think they're all singing or dancing, to be honest. It's amazing you can now see me and you're still with me. It's amazing. <laughs> New clearer prices, no hidden costs, only at Boots Opticians. All right, so uh, number one, boots opticians. Number two. Where are you going? Ow. Because even though your eyebrows terrify me, you did help me get that B in maths. Because you're the fittest girl in year 10. You gave me my first job. Because you're all right. 
he looked after my nan. Because you're always full of surprises. Love, Mum and Dad. This Christmas, let's make the people that make us feel good, feel good. Boots. Number two, Boots Christmas. <laughs> That's just part of the YouTube. And uh, number three... Number three, DJ. You're that guy running for Senate, aren't you? I am that guy, yeah. Are you a registered New York voter? Do I sound like I am? <laughs> David! I gotta go. Sorry. How was that? I don't know. What is this? We are the people who make sure things happen according to plan. We monitor the entire world. Oh. Can't outrun your fate, David. You've just seen behind a curtain that you weren't even supposed to know existed. This is your plan, and we're determined to keep it that way. You bumped into a woman this morning on the bus. Were you just staring at my legs? I was defenseless against the dress. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? Your path through the world is supposed to have been adjusted. You weren't ever supposed to see her again. If you truly love her, just walk away. Stay with her. It not only kills your dreams. All right, uh, I'll stop it there because it's quite a long trailer. So hopefully you got the gist. That's adjustment bureau. Um, and here they are: numbers one, boots opticians; number two, boots Christmas; or number three, the adjustment bureau. You have one minute. Here is the big reveal. So, the best was boots Christmas. The worst, adjustment bureau. Might be counterintuitive because obviously one is a movie, um, but that's what we found. So. What did you think about the Adjustment Bureau? Did anyone get that as the worst? I'll tell you what happened with that, Adi. It's really interesting with when we researched it. It starts off with really high levels of memory encoding. The brain's trying to follow this pattern. And it's a really complicated ad. It goes to and fro and backwards and forwards. And what happens is after about 10 seconds, brain response, memory response goes right down. Visual attention goes right up. So what the brain's doing, it's in the same mode where you would be for playing a computer game or something like Angry Birds. It's just taking all this in. The, the, the memory's going, whoa, it's just too much. Can't follow it. So although it was telling a story, it was telling such a complicated story without enough... You think about a story as a breadcrumb trail. It, there weren't enough links between the breadcrumbs to help the brain follow it. So whereas Boots Christmas was a very clear story, the opticians said it wasn't really a story, but it was a clear series of events, and so the brain could follow it more easily. So that's why that one did least well. So, we're on to number three. Um, strong emotions trigger memory. Um, and this is an evolutionary thing. If we have a strong emotional response to something, it, what happens in our brains? Signals coming from the outside world, through our eyes and ears, straight to the back of the brain. And the part, this part of the brain here is actually quite an ancient part of the brain. And it's the bit of the brain that's associated with things like fight or flight. You know the thing, if you go into a room for the first time and get the creeps, or you meet somebody and really like them, and it's not based on any information, it's just a sort of feeling, it's that part of your brain talking, it's, it's of emotional intensity. That's a really important response, because if you get a strong response here, this information that's coming from our eyes and ears, back of the brain, then gets passed forward, and it gets pa passed forward to the parts of the brain that are responsible for memory encoding. So strong response here is, tells the brain, this is important, something big's going on, pass that information forward, it's more likely to be remembered. If you're old enough, you think back to something like 9-11, you can remember where you were, what you were doing, who you were with. Your brain's saying something really big's going down. It might be in my evolutionary interest to remember this. So that's why that link exists. Uh, what, what, what it means in practice is, if you have a piece of communication that elicits a strong emotional response, it's more likely to be remembered. And that's actually why emotional advertising consistently is shown to perform very well. It's not just because it's emotional, although that is important, it can, it can colour brain response, but it also drives brain response. 
So it's a, it's a sort of double whammy. Um, so again, I'm going to hand over to Alice to throw you, show you three examples. All right, so let's go. Emotional intensity. At number one. CT, the next original. All right, so number one, Levi's. Number two. Flow. The unmistakable feeling of unstoppable. Of no problem that can't be solved. Of no one else can do it better. That whatever the day throws at you, Simply take it in your stride. Because you've found your rhythm. You're on top form. Okay, so number two is Lucas A's Find Your Flow, and number three. Comparing energy providers. Oh, joy. But when I heard that you switch had made it simple, well, that got me thinking. I mean, it's easy moaning about how high your energy bills are and doing absolutely nothing about it. Am I right? But, and here's the rub. In just a few clicks, you could save yourself a few hundred quid. So go on, get online, and have a look at you switch. Uswitch.com, the simple way to switch. Brilliant. Okay, number three, you switch. And here they are again. You have one minute. All right, so let's see uh, which ad did best and which ad did worst. Ta da! There we go. Yes, again, a few sighs, I thought there might be. <laughs> All right. Okay, sure. Um, Let's go straight into the next round then. The Levi's, it was, it was the music. We found the music was driving um, uh, memory coding that ad. It was very strong. Here's the bonus round. Okay, so basically, I'm gonna try and hope this works. We need two people from each team. Um, one person to stand here, and then the other counterpart to stand below them here. Um, what's gonna happen is um, either me or Heather are gonna hold this up, and you have a hat here. What you have to do is put these on the hat and then put the hats on their heads. I'm gonna show you a video of how that works. Um, this is what actually happens in the study. Right, so that's the explanation. Let's go. So you have to put them on one by one onto the hat and make sure they clip on so it looks like that all around on all the sensors. Then the hat goes over their head. Ask them to hold it there, just makes your life easier. And then you have to make sure the hat goes around the whole head. Then we have a strap which goes under the chin, which you can ask them to tighten, just to make sure there's a good, uh, good connection. And hopefully, you would have had a signal like this, which is what our output looks like. Right, so two people, please. Yep, from each team. Um, yeah, so one person from your team on the platform, and then one, one person from your team on the ground. And make sure you stand one behind each other. No, so one of you is going to be, be, uh, be the guy putting it on, and the other person is going to be the head. Okay, so the first person to put all the tips on and then put the hat on the person's head is going to win. Um, and then the best person to have the best connection. One person has finished. People are getting close. Yep. 
Okay, we've got you. One, two, three. Okay, everyone stop now. Everyone stop. So Holly and Alice are going to judge um, quality because they do this um, very regularly. We've got the fastest team, but what we're interested in now is the, the best fit for the cap. So we're looking at whether it's sort of even from one side to the other, whether all the sensors have got a good fit, whether the chin strap's on underneath. Um, any that have got a big problem, like chin strap not on, you can send away straight away. <laughs> yeah, I think just to pop the headset back down there, which is on the table. Okay, two points each. Okay, two points here, two points here for quality. Um, can you check that all 24 are on there because they, they won the, the quickest one? So, yeah, take, take it off and, um, and check. And if not, stay where you are because you might still be in line for the quickest one as well. All the sensors there? Okay. Was that taking it off or was it? Oh, but there's one other one missing. Oh, ah, so who was second fastest? Tell you what, we'll give you one point. You're supposed to get two, we'll give you one. Um, who is second fastest? Alish, who's second fastest? I think it was these guys, wasn't it? Can you just check the, the um, quality? Because, um, yeah, so they get one point for being second fastest as well. So Holly, do you know who the groups are? One point here. Yes, you can take them off now, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very good. We, we do train people a bit longer than that when we, when we do them in the groups, but um, not sure we've got brilliant readings, but you all look lovely. Um, Alish, he's disappeared. I'll see what we're going to do next. Actually, it's me. Okay, so um, we've got, are you all still with us? We've got our next round, which is that um, as human beings, one of the, th I know that was really exciting, but <laughs> are you still with me? Right. So as human beings, we're actually um, focused, we're, we're very attuned to other people. And one of the things that drives very, very strong responses is seeing people interacting, seeing you know, relationships between people, seeing emotions exchanged between people. And again, we've done statistical correlation exercises to show that advertising that focuses on a good level of interaction between people tends to do better than, than, than advertising with low levels. It's not enough just to have people in your ad. That doesn't make any difference when you do correlations. Levels of interaction do. So again, I'm going to um, hand over to Alish, if he's there, who's going to give you three examples again. We're back to the normal format. All right, yeah, back to normal. So, ad number one. Mom and Dad, this is Tim. Tim! At least you have a nice car. At least you have a nice... daughter. Life is too short to be boring. <laughs> Renault Clio. All right, so number one, Renault. Number two. In first means that from now on, we can send you free weekly balance updates by text. So if you're unsure, we can help you decide when you should splash out and when you shouldn't. Balance updates by text, just one of the ways we're working to put you... Number two is Lloyd's and number three... And number three is Clover. And here we go again. You have one minute. The best and the worst. And here are the winners. So the best was Clover. Yeah. 
The interaction. And the worst was Lloyd's. No interaction. OK, so we're motoring now. Um, next, next thing we're going to look at. We've got two. Oh, we've got another bonus round. How exciting. It's Alish again. Right, another bonus round. More chaos, probably. Um, we need one person from each team now. You're going to do something called a Stroop task. Um, please come to the front, uh, and we'll tell you what to do. So what the task entails is uh, you'll see words of colors on the screen, and the words will be a different color as well. What you have to do is name the color of the word and not what the word says, so the color. OK? Um, you have 10 seconds to get as far as you can. And you have to do this into the microphone as well, because then we can spot mistakes. Two points for getting to the end in 10 seconds. One point for getting halfway. All right. Here is a screen. So you, you have to say the color of the word and not what the word says in order. Stop learning. OK, so we're going to have people one at a time. Um, and I'm going to even give them the microphone just to, uh, to be really unfair. So you've got to, if, if you get through it in 10 seconds, you get a point. And get, or get, get, get through it in 10 seconds or halfway in two, two points to get through it. Yeah, if you get through it in 10 seconds, two points. If you get halfway through correctly, one point. If you make a mistake, no points. OK, have you all got that? 10 seconds to get through for two points. If you get halfway through 10 seconds, you get one point. If you make a mistake, you don't get any points. OK. Yeah. Uh, go. Blue, orange, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, purple, orange, purple, uh, orange, red, blue, green, Stop. red. Stop. Number two. Three, two, one, go. Blue, orange, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, purple, orange, purple, orange, red, blue, green, red. More than halfway, that's a point as well. Number three, please. Blue, orange, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, purple, orange, pink, purple, uh, yellow, uh, orange, red, blue. Halfway. No one's got to the end yet. Blue, orange, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, purple, orange, purple, orange, red, blue, green. Okay, blue, orange, green, red, purple, red, purple, blue, orange, green, green, red, wait, wait, purple. Mistake, mistake. Okay, all right. Okay, purple, red, purple, blue, orange, green, green, red, purple, blue, orange, red, Stop. blue, green. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid it wasn't quite right. You read the word. We got you. All right, next, please. Blue, orange, green, red, purple. Blue, green, red, purple, orange, purple, orange, red, blue, green, red. Good. Okay. A few people going down to the last line, but no one quite all the way. Blue, orange, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, purple, orange, purple, orange, red, blue, Green, red, blue, green, orange, purple. Yes. Well ah. done. <laughs> All right, and last up. No pressure. Blue, orange, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, purple, orange, purple, orange, red, blue, green, red, blue, green, orange, purple. Ten seconds. Bang on the dot. So the brain theory behind that is back to this left-right brain. Your left brain's got speech capability. So your left brain is trying to read the word. And your right brain is trying to say the colour. And the re left brain generally takes over. The faster you go, the, the more difficult it is to override the left brain. So that's um, the point of doing that. Really impressed by the last couple, because um, it's very rare people get to the end. And I certainly can't do it. So well done. Um, OK, this is one of my favourite ones. Um, this, has anyone come across the idea of Uncanny Valley? 
It's a psychological construct. The idea is, if you, um, if you had a graph, and one axis is um, degree of realism of a picture, and the other axis is degree of empathy, how empathetic we feel towards what we're seeing, generally you get a line that goes up from left to right. So the more real something looks, the more empathetic we are to it. So a stick man doesn't look very real, we're not very empathetic. A real person looks very real, we're very empathetic. There's something that happens, though, in that line. It's called Uncanny Valley, where you get, to it, where you get something that looks almost real, but not quite. And you see empathy goes right down, because that's where you get something that really looks creepy. You know the thing where you get an animation or a CGI that's not quite right, and we call it Uncanny Valley. And it's really striking in terms of brain response. When you see that happening, you see brain response go right down, and it has a negative impact on the way that we respond. Um, and loads of advertising are using CGI now. You're going to see three ads, you're going to see different examples of it, and you need to come to a view about how uncanny you feel these different, three different examples are. So the best is the one that's least uncanny, the worst is the one that really, really creeps us all out. Alish. All right, it's Uncanny Valley, let's go. Uh, number one. Gregor, Igor, how has CompareTheMarket.com affected... CompareTheMarket.com? CompareTheMarket.com. Yes. Compare the meerkat.com. Market. Meerkat. No, compare the market.com. Hey, meerkat. Market. Okay, cut, cut, cut. Here we go. It's finished. All right. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I should give you one more bit of information. And Cali Valley happens when, something, when we look at something and we think it ought to be real and it's not quite. And this is a bit of a clue. If something's clearly not meant to be real, it doesn't creep us out in quite the same way. So just a, a little clue there. Number two, no more clues. Little things that you do make me glad that I feel this way, the way you smile. It's the little things in life that make the difference. Andrex, it's the little things. Okay, number two, we had Andrex puppies, and number three. McVitie's Digestives, the crumbly cuddle of McVitie's. Sweet. Okay, and you know the drill, one minute, the best and the worst. And here is the big reveal. The best was McVitie's and the worst was Andrex. Um, and compare the market, it wasn't meant to look real. It was meant to look like it does, so that's why it didn't, wasn't the worst. So, um Interesting, that Andrex one, it, people don't mind seeing those animals, when, you know, the, the puppies when they were doing sort of things that puppies might do. As soon as you see them standing up on the hind legs or smoothing out the toilet paper, you've got these really negative responses. You know, people just go, ooh, you know, it's not quite how they look. Yeah, well, interestingly, we, we've researched a number of those ads, and sometimes they don't get it right. As long as they look real, people don't mind them coming out of the cookies. At a rational level, you say, well, that can't possibly happen. But they look okay. They look, you know, I mean, there is a clearly some subjective element in this as well, but you know, based on you know, a quant sample, that was absolutely the result we got. So we're going to go into the final round, um, round eight. Um, and this is about using patterns and repetition. So our brains actually are tuned to look for patterns in things. It's how we learn. It's how we make sense of the world around us. And so one good way of getting things into memory, again, not just in television, on any medium, is to introduce some sort of pattern. Now, that could be rhythm through music. It could be repeated words or phrases. It could be a repeated structure to the ad. But anything that lends an element of pattern or repetition tends to give the brain like hooks to follow through the ad and tends to lend, lend, lend itself to high levels of brain response. So final three ads, final round, all up for grabs. Right, so patterns and repetitions. Look for patterns. Ad number one. This 2016 
will be unlike any other 2016. Are we really going to do this? We have no choice. But only if you turn resolutions into reservations. Make this 2016 your best 2016 ever. Let's do it. Okay, ad number one for booking.com. Um, number two. Looking on price comparison sites isn't the only way to save money on your car insurance because comparison sites only quote for one car at a time. With Admiral Multicar, if you have two or more cars, you could save even more by insuring them all on one multi-car policy. So to make sure you don't miss out, go direct to Admiral.com. Admiral Multicar. One premium, one renewal, one policy. Okay, ad number two for Admiral.com and number three. And number three for the post office. And one minute. The worst and the best were post office, rhythm is a dancer, rhythm is repetition, um, and Admiral didn't have any. Well, this is very tense because as of the previous round, three teams were tying in first place. So um, this could be quite an important tiebreaker. Um, I'm going to just recap the key brain things we talked about because in the excitement of the quiz, I'm hoping that the sort of actual learning points haven't been missed. So uh, we've got a potential tie break round here. So I'm just going to whiz through this. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, so reminder of key learnings. Um, first thing, remember that memory is key. Emotion is really important, but if stuff doesn't get into memory, it can't possibly affect our future actions. So it's essential that things get into memory and they get linked to your brand in memory. Second point, and I'm going to take the point on board, let's not think about shouty advertising, think about messaging that's an overt sell. Hard sell messaging, in most contexts, doesn't work as well as something which is showcasing a product. Our brains love storytelling and narrative. That's how we make sense of the world, that's how we follow a series of events, and so stories and narrative are incredibly powerful. Um, strong emotions trigger memory. Remember that 9-11 example? It's an evolutionary thing, you have a strong emotional response, tends to drive stronger memory encoding. As human beings, we're tuned to interaction. We, um, we, we like to see people interacting with one another. Again, it drives stronger levels of brain response. Be, be careful about Uncanny Valley, particularly if you, th you think about using something like CGI. Um, an animal looking at the screen and talking is almost okay because you can get away with it because our brains know it's not meant to be real. But as soon as it starts being meant to be real and it's doing something that doesn't look quite right, the brain gets really creeped out and you get this uncanny valley effect. And finally, patterns and repetition. And very simple things, music and video. If you see music and um, the reason post office did very well there is you had repetition in the music and you had repetition in the actions. And our brains love it when music and action are coordinated. If you think about bad lip sync, how really disturbing that is when you're seeing one thing and hearing another. It's really upsetting for our brains. So one of the other things I could have put in here is if you're doing any sort of video form content, if you have sight and sound aligning, it'll be much more effective than if you just have one or two of them working independently. So a reminder there, sorry, was there a question? No? Just something. Oh, hi, hello. <laughs> They, they can learn things, but all the things I'm talking about here actually have an evolutionary basis. So yes, you can condition people to, to respond in slightly different ways, but I don't think you were here right at the start, but what I said right at the start is the things we've covered here are things that are consistent right across medium because they have an evolutionary basis to them. They'll vary by individual, they'll vary to some extent by culture, but the fundamentals, if you want some building blocks to start building from, then that, that's what these things are. Do we have an answer? Right. Um, Holly. Holly's been very quiet so far because she's been... Um, been zooming through and trying to, uh, to do things, but I'm going to let it to Holly to announce the winners. Maybe three in reverse order? Okay. No, no. So, well, we have a joint third or second one. Okay, so we have a joint, joint third place is Innovative Virtual Drinking Economy. I think, uh, Economist? Um, and Pinky and the Brains are also third. 
Um, in second place, we've got duplicate. And the winner is biscuits. <laughs> so well done to the winners. Thank you, thank you very much, everybody. You've been fantastic taking part. What I said at the start is absolutely right. Biscuits, if you're interested in a free slot in a study, and I hope you are, come and um, talk to us afterwards. We'll take your email addresses and um, we'll, we'll get that delivered to you. Anyone else who's interested in a half price go to study, again, if you come and give us our email addresses, we'll gladly do that. It doesn't commit you to anything. It just means if at some point in the future you want to go into one of our studies at half price, we'd, we'd be glad to do that for you. So uh, to get out of the way of the next speakers, we're going to head over there. Um, come and see us, please, with your email addresses if you're interested, and we'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much, everyone, for being really good sports and joining in. Thank you.